Welcome to another program of Zuzamen. Hi, Tzili. And Zuzamen is actually, we meet every week and chat with people that inspire us. And, you know, you are such an inspiration, but you know, never mind, we know that. So we um, welcome Richard Chuckner. Richard Chuckner is a is a multicultural unbelievable. persona. Yes. But he's also a professor at NYU yeah. and he's a director and he acted and he uh, established uh, a whole theory. Oh, he's a, the master of uh, performance studies, which he will tell us what it is. And uh, so let's start talking to him so right. he can tell us. More. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> hi, Richard. It's all right. I'm I'm enjoying listening. We only we, we, just, we just touch, you know, the the you know the a little bit, the little, little bit, bit yeah. you know. But uh, there is so much. Um, you you don't want to start with this well, office, since, right? Well, since okay. we cannot cover everything, uh, just let's start with your surrounding. Where are you? I'm sitting in apartment 1U in 1 Washington Square Village in Lower Manhattan, uh, two blocks south of Washington Square Park. It's an NYU building. This is a studio apartment on the ground floor. I don't live here, although back over there, no, excuse me, over here is a, <laughs> there is a, a, a small bed, happens to be the uh, bed of my wife Carol Martin when she was a little girl so or oh. a teenager so it's a bed from her childhood but I sometimes take a nap there mm-hmm. and in this room there are about 3,000 books I guess and all of my uh, uh, notebooks you can't see them they're up over my head which I began keeping in 1955 or so mm-hmm. and so uh, there are 70 or 80,000 pages of those and I've been working on uh, some of them uh, to uh, about my work in India. So this is a particular notebook from, uh, here's some pictures. I do a lot of drawing. Oh, you do? So, yeah. I did. Yeah. No, this, this, is from, uh, wow. this is from India. And so this notebook is from 1976, from August to October 1976. And I use it when I, when I, when I write. And then there are many, many, many masks here. What do you have uh, behind you? Oh, but are, do you archive everything, Richard? What do you mean archive? I, I don't throw away much and I do archive, but there's a, a collection of my, there, my papers are at Princeton University Library. So okay. most of my stuff, this is the, what's here is what I want to keep near to me for the time being. And uh, what's there is what I've already given them, uh, 80 or 90 boxes of things. So when people do research on my ideas, they often go to Princeton. Also here, I have to say, I'm not alone. Uh, Michaela Brinsley, say hi, Michaela. Hi. Is hi. Uh, my, Where? my assistant. And okay. she's, uh, she's back, uh, no, back that way in the kitchen. And she's uh, working now on... Uh, uh, archiving and uh, detailing a lot of the slides of my productions back over the years because I need to get them in some kind of order and the things that were in my closet. How many uh, slides do you think you went over uh, finally? A couple of I thousand. Think, yeah, at least 2,000. At least 2,000 of those from different productions. And then I have 8,500 photographs of this Indian performance. So I do a lot of collecting and archiving. And I like this room. I'm sure. What's the face behind you between the windows? The face behind me between the windows. The piece, the piece those, the the windows behind you. The, yeah. The, the blonde uh, uh, young woman there. Wh- which one? Uh, over there. Yeah, over yeah, there. This yeah, one. this one. This one? Yeah. Yeah. That's my daughter, Sophia. No, no, above and, her. No, 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 above her. It's an artist, an artifice. It's Indian an art. Thing. It's an art. It's oh, an you, art. Oh, yeah. in this. Yes. 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 That is Ravana, the ten-headed demon king of Lanka. Now, in the Indian uh, Sanskrit epic Ramayana, uh, is the story of Rama, who is the uh, sixth avatar of Vishnu. Uh, maybe he's the seventh. I have to check. He's the sixth or seventh avatar of Vishnu, and uh, his he comes to Earth to rid the world of that. Demon King Ravan, who's uh, who has been uh, wreaking havoc 
And so that's why he was incarnated as Ram. And Ram is a very, very important uh, Hindu god. And uh, uh, they're, they're, this epic was retold in the 16th century in Hindi by a man named Tulsi Das, Goswami Tulsi Das, who lived in Varanasi, which is also known as Benares or Kashi. And based on the Tulsi Das version, a play was devised called the Ram Lila, the play of Ram, which has performed thousands and thousands of uh, places around the world each year annually. But in this one place, Ramnagar, which is a small town across the Ganga River from Varanasi, it, is, it takes 31 days. And that's the longest enactment of this play. And it occupies the entire town. Uh, one scene takes place near the Maharaja's palace. One scene takes place down the street. Another scene takes place in a huge field, which is called Lanka, where Ravan is the king. And it takes 31 days. And I've been studying wow. that play since 1971, a long time. And yeah. I've written quite a bit about it, but I constantly return to it. And also you can't see, but over here, I'll, I'll get you a couple of things that'll be interesting to you. So uh, no since I am a, yeah. a Jewish, I've also studied, but I'm also Hindu. So here is my- What do you mean you are Hindu? Uh, I, well, this You're is my conversion certificate from, um, see me, that's 1976. And it says, it didn't change. this is to certify that Mr. Richard Schechner, New York City, a Jew by faith, has been converted into a Hindu mm. and named Jaya Ganesh as per her request after perform, performing purificatory rites at this ashram on 7-7-1976. So wow. I am I'm both Jewish and Hindu. There's the proof, the Sri Gram Krishna ashram. And over there, I have uh, 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 I, uh, another likeness of this demon king, Ravan. Uh, and I also have a likeness of Jaya come Ganesh. Back, come back. <laughs> so I'm coming back. I'm coming back. So come. here is another likeness of that same man, the 10 heads. You see, you see he has 10 heads. Yes. Yes. And this is the elephant god Ganesh, who I'm named after. Oh. And I have a little uh, uh, shrine over there. So it's a very uh, uh, multi, you know, uh, I believe that religion is a creation of humans. So- But uh, you are not really, are you religious? Well, I'm religious in the sense that I'm an atheist. Come back, come back. I'm coming back. I, I have to put you. Robin back. So uh, let's say that I'm a, uh, a religious atheist. In other words, uh, I don't believe in God, but, but I do. Going to the synagogue, no? I go to I, synagogue quite often. I know. I go to synagogue on Fridays. I like the I like the music. I like standing and sitting. Are you like I never, I, Are I you never like hold a sidur. I never hold a sidur in my hand huh. because I'm not interested in the prayers in the prayer. uh, as written. I, the ones that I know by memory, I'll do. The ones that I don't know, I I won't do. And why do I do it? Because I feel that religion is a very complex creation of humanity. And it's done uh, probably equally bad and good things. In other words, more people have died brutally because of religions mm -hmm. and religious wars. Uh, we know that Christians, and Protestants have fought Catholics, uh, Hindus have fought Muslims, Jewish and Palestinian. Jews have fought uh, Muslims. If you read, in fact, I took as a project uh, this past year to read the entire Bible, Old Testament and New Testament. So after you get through the Torah, after you get through the first five books, the next section, the, the this middle section before you get to the prophets, Isaiah and so on, is the bloodiest set of uh, books you can ever imagine. Yes. The conquest, one city after another where everybody was killed, you know, men, women, children, they were all slaughtered. So it's it's uh, it, it's it's a very it's a very bloody and, and brutal story, uh, and 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 yet it's an it's an enormous uh, creation. This creation of the the world's panoply of religions, whether it's Buddhism or Hinduism or Islam or Judaism or Christianity, 
uh, they, they are, uh, and, and many, many, many more, of course. These are the ones that uh, get the headlines. But wait a so minute. Anyway, I'm, I'm interested in that. So in that sense, I'm religious because I did a lot of study of religion. I observe and practice rituals. I like them, but I don't connect them to, uh, uh, to any supernatural power. I don't mm -hmm. think there is such. Uh, but, uh, you know, I once wrote, uh, I don't, uh, believe what the people believe, but I believe that the people believe. Right. And so I'm interested in studying the that which the people believe, but I don't believe what they believe, except, you know, there's a huge difference, a uh, similarity rather, between theater and religion. In theater or in film, you invent characters, you play them as if they're real, you give your whole life to this imaginary, so what's the difference between that and giving your life to an imaginary god or something? It's yes. a huge theater. Yes, but, but it's a little bit different because in theater you go home. With the oh, well, you can go home from religion too. And I, I would suspect that most people go home. You know, you go to Yom Kippur, you fast for a day, and the next day you go out and get a bacon sandwich and pass the beggar by. <laughs> so, uh, you know... Uh, I think most yeah. people go home from it. Richard, listen, when I look at you, so uh, I, I think, Tilly, we will in a minute, we'll ask you briefly to tell our uh, friends, audience, you know, it's on YouTube, um, what is performance art? But when I look at you, I wonder which character I'm looking at, because you are no, there's so no such thing. There's no such thing as a Richard Schechner us. You know, we're all a kind of confluence of forces. And at any particular moment, these, whether they're neurons or energy fields, at any particular moment, these forces are reconstituted in a particular way. It's like a cloud. If you look at a cloud, it's always being dissolved and reformed. From a distance, it looks like a, a solid thing, but then you can fly right through it and you see it uh, condensing and reaffirming. So person, the person you're talking to now is the Richard Schechner in dialogue with Sweepy, and I've even forgot silly. your name. Silly, silly. Tilly. 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 So in dialogue with Tipi and Tilly at this moment, and of course, this Richard shares things with earlier and other Richards, but it's a, it's, it's a particular constellation. What makes Alzheimer's and all kinds of dementia so horrible is that this ability to uh, condense and uh, refract, to move back and forth, to be fluid, goes away. And, and the person is left only with their immediate presence. You know, uh, Buddhism talks about present centeredness, but we don't want to be totally present because if we're totally present and have no past and have no future, that's exactly what an Alzheimer's person has. They have no past, they have no future. So we, we do talk, want to be, we do want to be present echo. centered, but we want to be present centered in the shadow of the past and in the anticipation of the future. But when you direct Hector, yes. uh, you know, I, well, I tend to tell them and the screenwriter that there is no flashback, but only flash present. That if you have a memory of yourself five years old, you actually see yourself or feel yourself as five years old. It's in the present, you feel like. It's, you it's in the present, but it's also very often an imaginary five years old. In other words, our memories are not very reliable. The reason I love to keep my notebooks is that I can go back 20 or 30 years and really see what I thought, or at least what I wrote In at that time, time yeah. which is often very, very much different than what I remember I thought or wrote. So, yeah. uh, you know, it's like when we look at a photograph and we say, oh, that's not me. I couldn't have really looked like that, but we did look like that. So, uh, although that's only the, the, the surface. Right. So, yes. I think that we are all, we do live in a continuous present in the sense that our memories are reconstructed as we remember mm -hmm. them. Uh, but what what is also intriguing about that is that we do project into the future. We do make plans, maybe short plans. Where am I going to have supper? Or longer plans? You know, how am I going to write this next book or direct this next you play? You connect it to the need. You connect it to the need. The you know. need. Yeah, N E E D. I mean, need. Like, oh, if need. I have a you need know, now, means... don't I project it to the future? Yeah, well, 
you know, needs needs CP or something we need to uh, try to do away with insofar as we can. I mean, that much I'll go Bye. along with the Buddhism. Desire and needs are really troubling emotions. We, we always have them, but the more we can liberate ourselves from them, not only the happier we will be, but the happier the rest of the world will be. But I mean, what, does, what does Putin need right now? Right. He, he needs to stop needing so much. You see, that's a very interesting angle. So, and before we go on, can you just talk briefly what is performing art? I know that you are talking about- Performing art arts and performance studies. What do you mean? Performing both. I mean, performance art is a, is a sub-genre of performance, you know, uh, Marina Abramovich or uh, hundreds of others. It's, it's a form of theatrical, but it also involves dance and music. Uh, performances done by often individual artists uh, in uh, various locations. It, its historical roots go back to Alan Caprow and Happenings and the Vienna Actionists and Dada and Surrealism. And it, it's practiced by hundreds of people in small venues or on streets or whatever. That's performance art. It's not theater as such, and it's not dance or music, but it, it incorporates those and is often done by solo performers. Performance studies is a whole other thing. Performance studies is an academic discipline. It, uh, there are 30 or 40 or 50, I don't know how many departments of performance studies now. They're very often what are called TAPS in English, theater and performance studies. Uh, it's a field that I was one of the pioneers of back in the uh, uh, late 60s and early to mid 70s. and it, took its first name at NYU in 1980, when the drama department changed its name to the performance studies department. And I was the senior member of that drama department. And uh, it studies what I call the broad spectrum of performance, play, sports, games, ritual, the aesthetic genres of theater, dance and music, popular entertainments. It takes a very broad view of performance. It also says that anything can be studied as performance. In other words, you can apply uh, performance uh, questions and modalities, costume, action, uh, uh, dramaturgical ideas to anything, to uh, a business meeting, to our uh, uh, YouTube uh, meeting today, uh, uh, to a bus driver driving. You can look at anything as performance. But what is performance is defined by what a particular culture at a particular time says is a performance. So the word performance, which was not very much in use 20 or 30 years ago, is now all over the place. Yes. And sometimes it means something good, like uh, I want to in improve my sexual performance. It's kind of interesting to think how performance is adapted to sexuality or my performance as a professor or as an artist. And sometimes it's looked at as bad. He's only performing. That's a, a performative event. That's just a performance, which means it's false because actors are not really the characters they say they are. So that word you know, has these uh, a, a broad range of values from highly positive to highly negative. But so I, I don't know, you also in China, right? I've been in China, yes. So there's a Richard Schechter a Center, Center for Performance yeah. Studies in China, yes. So what what uh, draw you, it's almost like a wandering Jew, to India, I'm to a wandering China, Jew. to Poland. A Hashuaris, you could call me. A what? <laughs> a Hashuaris is the wandering Jew. Yeah, so, yeah. So right. what, what draw you to... A... No, it's not just China. Uh, I'm drawn to an untold number of cultures. I would love you know, to have been able to have visited every, every place in the world. I haven't, but I, I, I happily, I've been to every continent except, except Antarctica, which uh, I wouldn't mind going to, but uh, the human it's society like there is not much. It's what? like a cultural anthropologist, mm -hmm. anthropologist, <laughs> no? Yes, well, one of my books is called Between Theater and Anthropology. So oh. I'm very interested in anthropology and I've written a lot about from an anthropological perspective. I have an essay called Points of Contact Between 
anthropological and theatrical thought. But anyway, you asked me what attracted me to China. You know, when I go to a place, it's often in response. Uh, I, I, I like to think of myself more as a sailboat than a motorboat. So uh, very often uh, it happens that I have students. So I had students from China and uh, both from the mainland and from Taiwan and from Hong Kong, from all those places. And one uh, student, Sun Weizhou, uh, William Sun, uh, he uh, was a professor at the Shanghai Theater Academy. And when he went back to China, he invited me to come there. And I, I did come there and I actually directed a play of his in 1989. So I went because I was invited. Uh, but of course, I, I knew China as a great civilization and, a, and as an enormously interesting place. And when I did arrive, there was another former student, Cao Lusheng, who translated one of my books, Environmental Theater, into Chinese early on. In fact, I think uh, uh, Lusheng, the Chinese have put their family name first and their given name last. So Cao Lusheng is like Schechner Richard. So anyway, so Lusheng and I took a trip to the interior of China, which few people do, two-day train ride uh, into Guiyang province and Guizhou. And, and at a time in the 1980s, when uh, China was still very poor in the interior, it was a very uh, eye-opening uh, trip. But even before that, I went to India. So I, I went to India first, and I actually have traveled to uh, pretty well every, every country in Asia. So I had a particular interest in Asian uh, performances because they are often codified. That is, they, are, they follow set rules and they're done with uh, great grace and power and very different than Western performance. And uh, so I, I've seen those kind of performances in, in many different places in, uh, in Asia, Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, Australia, so if they do Hamlet in each one of those places, China, yes, I, I, right. I actually directed Hamlet in China. Okay, so and, does it, is it different? Because, okay, so you speak about performance, right? right. And where, what we draw a lot from our culture or some of it from our culture. So then we do Hamlet. How a Chinese do Hamlet? Well, I did it. I should give you the videotape. So my Chinese Hamlet was performed in Shanghai and it was also taken on a festival tour to Romania, uh, but yeah, we never, we never brought it to the United States. What? Do you approach it differently than if you do Hamlet here? In of Hamlet course, but, but I approach it differently. I've done Hamlet twice here too. So each of those was different. How? So uh, the, the thing that is similar is that I had, I, I always think of Hamlet as the prototypical outsider. So once I did Hamlet here, he, I cast an African-American young man as Hamlet, oh. figuring a black man yeah. in the court of Denmark would certainly be regarded as an outsider, a strange person, not exactly belonging. In China, I had Hamlet as, uh, as gay, as homosexual, and he had a relationship, a lover's relationship with Horatio. And I think there's real evidence for that in the play, actually. No, the that's what I, my question. Are you stick to the uh, through line to the core of the play? Well, I, the, the, you take the, gay or... I, I take the through line of the play is, you know, uh, it is what I say it is. Obviously, in certain performances I've done, I've changed the words. In other oh. performances, I haven't changed the words. Wow. So, for example, the chutzpah a little bit. What? Are you changing a Shakespeare words? That's not. No, a no. Uh, yes, in one of my productions of Shakespeare called Macbeth with a K, I gave myself the rule that I would use only words that were in the play, but not necessarily in the same order. So I rewrote the whole play, but I, but my vocabulary was what was in the play. That was pretty good production. So you say it, based it followed on the same play, what the you same say plot based on when you when what you I said play. after Macbeth. Okay, fine. After Shakespeare. But Richard, when I did Dionysus in 69, I, I combined the improvisations of the actors with Euripides' text. When I did Hamlet, however, I stuck very close to Shakespeare's text, 
Of course, in China, it doesn't really matter. It's a translation. So we're sticking close to the translation of Shakespeare's text into Mandarin, but not his actual words. When I did Hamlet the second time in, in, uh, uh, at Cornell University, uh, no, no, uh, in New York, it was waiting for Godot at Cornell. In New York, I stuck to the Shakespeare text, but which Shakespeare text? There's the first quarto, there's the second quarto, and there, there's the, the first quarto. folio. And there's 800 lines difference between the folio edition and the first quarto edition. Now, I, I, I use very much of the first quarto edition, which was probably what an actor took from the play as his sides, it's very much shorter than the second quarto or the folio. So if you study Shakespeare, Hamlet, you're usually reading the folio edition, but the folio edition was published six years after Shakespeare's death. He had nothing to do wow. with the putting together of that text. That's he amazing. put together the first quarto and the second quarto, possibly. We don't know how much wow. he was involved in preserving his text. But even Hamlet has three distinct versions that uh, are, are in many ways very different from each other. Yeah. So as a director, as a dramaturg, you have a lot of choice there. At any rate, my basic theory is that, of course, I'll take the words of an author and do with them as I please. Like a painter takes the painting colors and does as, as she or he pleases. In other words, I sometimes respect the words of the author and sometimes not. But Richard, those days, China wasn't so exposed to the Western culture. And you well, yes and no. It wasn't exposed in the commodity culture that we now have. It wasn't exposed you know, to, uh, uh, to Amazon and to uh, uh, Macintosh and all of that. But China was a very sophisticated, uh, the upper echelons, uh, the ordinary person, no. But I would say that the ordinary person in New York, the ordinary person in Indiana well, is also know. not much exposed to Western right. culture. <laughs> you know? uh, so but when you talk... do the adaptation to, yeah. to, Man to Mandarin, do you yes. combine it with the local uh, cultural uh, symbolism or- uh... Yes, like for example, within that production, the play within a play was a classic Chinese opera played by children. And so uh, there's some evidence in the Shakespeare text that the play within a play was a, a children's group. Uh, at any rate, I made it children and the play within a play, the poisoning through the ear was done by eight year olds. And that's what uh, uh, the uh, uh, Claudius saw. But at the same time, the, uh, my production was a film version. You'd like this. I had three cameramen always on the wow. stage. The stage was an environmental theater stage, no proscenium. And they would come very close in so that on large screens around the room, you'd see close-ups of Hamlet, of uh, Gertrude, of Claudius, and the, and the uh, photographers would move in and out so that the play was both the performance and the movement of the, wow. uh, the cameras and I called them microphonists, microphone people who would put the microphone in the face of the actors, you know. Is and it have not the like microphone. a sharpness between film and theater? Like It was between film and theater. Because so I remember we when I, I read about what his name, Maren, Marenhof, I already forgot his name. Marowitz? Yes, the Russian. Oh, Meyerhold, you mean Meyerhold. Right, I think that he tried to imitate film by actually uh, inventing the the, uh, so, so, well, Meyerhold, the one of, one of Meyerhold's uh, students was uh, the guy, you know, uh, Eisenstein, who uh, invented the term montage. Right. So right. that uh, that at that point, film and theater were very close together mm -hmm. in terms of their theory. But I, I did this so that my Hamlet in China was a film as much as it was a stage production. So, for example, the closet scene where Hamlet confronts his mother. There were clothes racks all around. The audience couldn't see what was going on, but I had a camera there wow. so they could watch it only on film. It's it very was... modern. It's like now the AV and no. What? It's it's a very modern approach. Absolutely. Modernist. It's okay. only now they start that to. Long ago, that was 
my hamlet in in China was uh, around 2000 or something. And I have to check when it was. It wasn't so long ago. I also did the Aristia in Taiwan, or the Greek tragedies, the three Greek tragedies. And I rewrote the final one uh, as a TV talk show. I have to think so, about you rewriting the great masters. <laughs> I mean- Why not? Great masters took other stories and rewrote them. Right. That's what yeah, they did. But, they didn't but invent I always anything thought he's a great master. I know, but yeah. still, I never, I, I didn't know. See, I know um, that in films, unfortunately, at least in Israel, um, the actors think they can rewrite the script. And well, if they're good in, enough, why not? In theater, too. In theater, yeah, okay. they also try to change the text. Um, but I thought in theater in Europe, in America, you don't touch the text. Oh, well, it depends who. Um, okay, most, that's a good answer. Don't. But I don't look at the text. To, you know, when you say don't touch the text, you're giving to the text the, the status of the Bible or some sacred text. What about Not the sacred. player, the violinist? He will change the notes of Mozart or Beethoven? Well, People maybe. It, you can change the notes of Mozart. And they then the yeah. person who wants to play Mozart the way Mozart wrote it should play it that way. It doesn't destroy it by doing that. It gives you variations. I mean, what is genetics after all? Let's look at genetics. We're three of us are the products of our parents' genetics and they're the products of their, it's always mix and mix and mix and change and change and change. To freeze well, something is to make a, a pyramid of it. I don't like pyramids. If you have a production that you decide from the beginning, let's have, let's play. So you give them a very, very stable, base and then on the top of it you can run around and uh, improvise you know as you like but if one is doing it and the rest are not doing it it doesn't mix well but he decided. Well, it depends you know with all of this are your talk now is just academic so if you want to look at Dionysus in 69 which was structured this way or Macbeth these are my productions then you can make a judgment of course I'm not trying to do something sloppy and I'm not trying to do something undisciplined. So uh, the proof is in various puddings. You know, uh, uh, there is some evidence that Shakespeare himself used improvisation. In other words, that really? how did he write all these I'm things? I'm for you. I'm not against it because I think it's more interesting. And I yeah. think it's- uh, You know, he changed a uh, uh, Brecht. I, why did you take away the no, carriage? No, I, I didn't the change carriage. Brecht. I just didn't it's use fair. the- uh, the wagon in Mother Courage, but the right. text I kept. And Why? the people from Brecht's own theater came and said that was the best production of Mother Courage, except for Brecht's own production and Giorgio Strahler's production in Milan. And they invited it to Berlin. So we Why weren't able to Why did you take out the carriage? Why did you eliminate Because it? I felt if I kept the carriage, I would have to follow earlier productions. The carriage determines what goes on. If I take it away, that forces me and my team to be creative about the staging and about the meaning. Mm -hmm. So we turned our whole space into the wagon, as it were, through a series of ropes and so on. It was a fabulous production, wow. I must say. So doing that, you didn't change the intent of the play? Well, I don't know. Uh, I don't know what the intent of the play is. Nobody knows the intent of these things. Even Brecht, who wrote a great deal, you, the, the playwright's intent, that, that is really up in Never Never Land. We don't know. So oh. for example, the great plays of, again, let's look at Shakespeare or the other Elizabethans or the Greeks. They never wrote playwrights notes. They didn't write stage directions. We don't know what their intentions were. We have the thing itself. Uh, whenever I do a play, that's the first thing I disregard is the playwright's introduction and the stage directions. I'm interested in what the artist contributes as the art, which is the words. So that of the playwright. Now, for the most part, if you look at my whole career, I've mostly not changed the words of the writer. When I did Sam Shepard's Tooth of Crime, I didn't change it. Mother Courage, I didn't change it. You know, blah, blah, blah. And in some I did, and some I devised my own work. Like the latest Hamlet I did was called Imagining O, which takes the story, only the words that women in Shakespeare's Hamlet speak. So it's only Gertrude and Ophelia. What does she say? What do they say? No Hamlet, no Claudius, no Polonius, none of the men, only the women. And so what are, the, what are their words if you just have their words? 
and I combined it with a French erotic novel called The Story of O, a pornographic novel actually, written by a woman, and it has its own story, but her name is O, and Ophelia's name is O, and the French word for water is O, and Ophelia drowns, and O also means zero, nothing, but O, if you put a number, a one before it is uh, 10, and if you put two O's, it's 100, so it's a, something that multiplies. So I, I and, and that play took place in 11 different locations simultaneously in, uh, in Montclair. It was very good. I have, I have very good uh, videos of these plays if you ever want to see them. Yes. So, uh, you know. I think it's wonderful because it gives new life to classics everywhere all the time. Absolutely. And instead of to expect what you know and, you, and you just see the version of Yes, the and every classic was a new play, a new performance at one point. I want to ask you what? about the Worcester Group because yes, I, I remember when I came to New York, this was the most interesting uh, theatrical experience in the city. Uh, very unusual, very unlike yes. Broadway. And it was always very small and it ran for right. many years and it disappeared. No, the Worcester Group was still there. It's they they just did a new play, Breakfast the Mother. They just did it a, a, a month ago. So they didn't disappear. Okay. They're in the same theater called the Performing Garage, oh. on Worcester Street, which okay. I founded. And Elizabeth Lecomte was my assistant director for a number of years. She also was a, an actor in right. several of my plays. She was in Mother Courage, and she was also in uh, Tooth of Crime and Cops, several, several performances. But the theater is still there, okay. and the Worcester Group is still there. That's cool. Tell me something, when you direct and you have actors who come from different methods, whatever, some right. come Stanislavski, some come, you know, uh, does it have any effect? Yeah, well, I, I do my own training with the actors. So oh. I've developed a training method called Rasa Boxes. There's a book on that coming out. And I have a book called Environmental Theater, which talks about training. So uh, I always take the group I'm working with and give them some basic training in order to, uh, to make them harmonious, to yes. make them uh, work with each other. Because indeed, they come from all these different schools of training. And so it's good to get some common ground. So I do- What the common ground? What the basis? And so uh, first of all, we do, we do some yoga. I learned uh, yoga in India from a great yoga master in Krishnamacharya. And then I, I give them some basic yoga some vocal exercises, which I learned from a woman named Kristen Linklater, who also used yoga. <laughs> Different kinds of resonators to strengthen the voice. And then uh, various acting exercises. Again, in my books, I've specified what those exercises are. And a lot of people use these exercises now. We, we, so we're out there. Yeah, and, we uh, the Do you have, we have a problem suddenly with the internet? Is it on yours? No. Never mind. But we it's can, okay. It's okay. Um, Richard, when you, when you uh, bring a new uh, group of actors, do you do this uh, course with them before you start the, the rehearsal? Rehearsals, yes. It starts, the sequence is training which you, you have to use, is these, these overlap. They don't go exactly in a sequence, but basically training in which you get people to speak or do the same, the same physical way. and vocal vocabulary. Then workshop, where you're investigating all the possibilities that could make a performance, and then rehearsal, and then performance. But even when you get to the performance, you never stop changing. I would always... Right meet with the actors every day, even during performance, and we make changes. Oh. It's, it's, if it stops being organic, it should end. Do you take non-actors? Sure, oh. because you make actors out of non-actors. You know, I mean, I would even take dogs if I could train them properly. But oh. <laughs> uh, uh, so uh, I've worked with people who have had a lot of prior training and I've worked with people who have had none. And I also am very interested in musicians 
and dancers. Dancers are particularly good because they really have an awareness of their bodies. Mm -hmm. Even if I, and let's say it's a ballet dancer, I may not use ballet in the performance, but uh, he or she will have an awareness of right. uh, their body, which will be useful. So, uh, yeah. but also some great choreographers like Bill T. Jones or Jerome Bell, they work with untrained people and they choreograph with untrained people. So that uh, that notion that you have to be a uh, uh, highly trained in this particular dis discipline to perform in it is no longer operative, though the training is good as well. So it's not like you want to work only with untrained, but you can you can put untrained and trained together and then the workshop uh, and the training process helps train them. Yeah. I, I, do you are you know do you know a little bit or more or, or a lot about Israel theater? I know a little bit about Israeli theater. I mean, uh, I've been there a few times. I've seen Gesher. I've seen uh, I know uh, Ati Citron and the people. I know the Free Theater of Janine. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, there are a couple of people from Israel on my editorial board at, T at Sharon Halavi, Halevi is on my, the editorial board of, of TDR. TDR is a magazine for drama, right? Yes, uh, and I've been to Israel uh, a number of times. In fact, the first time I went to Israel, I met Moshe Feldenkrais, who ah. helped me a lot on my back. I was in 1965. Her mother is a teacher of Feldenkrais. Ah, well, I actually, <laughs> was with him and he, he worked with me. So I went to uh, Israel in 1965. And at that point, I had not studied yoga yet. I had not been to India and my back was hurting me. And when I got there, I, I said, my back's hurting me. He said, you must see Moshe. I said, Moshe, who's Moshe? You must see Moshe. We'll take you to Moshe. So there he was, this little man. He was like, like five foot five or something. And he said, he looks at me, he says, okay, Go, crawl on the floor on your hands and feet, feet, not hands and knees, hands and feet. And just do that for 10 minutes a day, you'll be better. And I was, it did, it worked. Tell me something, and um, it's really real. If you will take, I, I'm going a bit aside. If you will take uh, Israelis and Palestinians together. Yes. What kind of method you think you can use uh, like performing? Well, you see, uh, the, you, again, you ask abstract questions. Uh, and and I can't give concrete answers to abstract questions. I can say I would work with Israelis and Palestinians together. And along with physical training that we would do, breathing and yoga that together, we would have to deal with their feelings about each other, uh, uh, nationally and locally. That is their feelings about the question and then their feelings about the individuals. So I have one exercise called crossing where you cross from two sides of the room and in the middle, one person to another, they meet and you whisper something to each other. Uh, but it begins with not whispering. It begins with you cross and you hug and you think what I would say to this other person if there were no inhibitions. I don't have to say it. So I'm not constrained by having to say it, but what would I say to this other person? So I would do that exercise and slowly I would uh, make sure that the tensions between the two groups, I want to see if those tensions would be present in these two uh, uh, sets of individuals. So there is the global thing of being, quote, a Palestinian and being, quote, a Jewish Israeli. Uh, uh, and, and I'm assuming you mean a Palestinian from the occupied territories right. and not yeah. a, a, a Israeli Palestinian, so also. So, uh, and then I would have to also share my feelings, which are extraordinarily complex in this matter, because, you know, uh, as, a, as a Jew, as a person barely old enough to remember the Holocaust, but old enough to remember it, I was born in the early 1930s. Uh, I mean, obviously I was in the United States, but a cousin of mine came over from Germany and so on and so forth. Uh, and, uh, uh, and yet as a person who's always been I'm sorry, uh, <laughs> two of you, but I've been always ambivalent about Zionism as a project to start with. So uh, even when I was a young man, uh, and yet I want the state of Israel to flourish, 
but then I go back and forth between, quote, the so-called two-state solution and the unitary state solution, and uh, et cetera. And I'm glad that Israel is now recognized by more and more countries in the, in the Gulf and so on. But uh, again, I have such mixed feelings about the UAE and Saudi and so on. So to recognize, you know, it's, if you talk about a complex question, there's no question that I know of politically and socially, and in this sense, personally, because of my Jewish identity, uh, uh, then the, that question. Yeah. And then I go Mama back to my own family. I have rabbis in my family and, and so on and so forth. I, the first map maker of Israel was a member of my family, a man named Joseph Schwartz, who came over to Israel in 1848. And he was my grandfather's brother, excuse me, my great grandfather's brother. And one went to the United States and one went to quote, Palestine. Palestine or whatever. It was part of the Ottoman Empire. It wasn't, even, it wasn't Palestine yet. Palestine came into existence with the British. It was just part of the Ottoman Empire. It was the Holy Land. It, would have, it had no particular name. But anyway, he drew the first maps. You look him up, Joseph Schwartz. Well, and um, so I have this deep uh, relationship, but it's a very ambivalent relationship. Right. Right. But you know, many of us do have this ambivalent uh, Even relationship we, you because know. Yes, you know, know, in one hand, for us, Israel is home. It's so obvious, and you don't want to see your home shaken or destroyed. But on the other hand, all these questions that you raise exist because. Right. Um, so it's it's there all the time. It's there all the time. You know, it's there all the time, and then you want you yeah. know you have these kind of things. You talk about the unitary state, and then you say, but. Well, all these Arab countries, they expelled the Jews. So why? Right. So uh, w my main defense, when people uh, uh, question me, interrogate me, I said, you know, the Jewish state, for whatever it is, is no better or worse, really, than any other state. In other words, uh, what state hasn't committed crimes? So why do you expect us to be that different? Probably mm -hmm. in the balance of things, the Jewish state is less than, you know, we didn't exterminate all the native tribes the Jewish state didn't exterminate the native tribes as the Americans did. Right. Uh, you know, yeah, uh, but right. you know, it's easier right. to defer the headaches to our region, and then they can do their thing. Because I think, as you said, yes. But at the same time, I'm not justifying the genocide against the Native Americans. So it's it's very complicated. Now, I have very, last question for you. Uh, how do you? What do you think? I just thought about it now. Uh, what artificial intelligence and the three D how they are going to affect art? Oh, of course. Uh, the the uh, webinar I did yesterday was all about artificial intelligence. And TDR, my journal, is going to do a special issue on artificial intelligence. So there is a theory called the singularity. Have you ever heard of the singularity oh. theory? So there's a, a writer named Ray Kurzweil. He writes science fiction, but he's also a very good thinker. And the singularity is the time when these thinking machines, artificial intelligence, are able to do two things. They're able to self-replicate. In other words, they're able to evolve. They're able to create other machines or other networks without any intervention by human beings. And they acquire self-consciousness. They're aware of themselves as you're aware of yourself at CP and TV, and I'm aware of myself as Richard and so on. They have that self-consciousness and memory of their earlier selves and so on. And he calls that time the singularity. And he predicts that around 2050, we will have artificial intelligence that will be self-conscious and uh, evolve on its own. At that point, the question will be whether the human species will be uh, succeeded by this artificial species. In other words, just like uh, we are the same as, but different from the chimpanzees and so on and so forth. So these artificial uh, intelligence beings, they will no longer think of themselves as artificial. That's a kind of denigrating name that we humans put on them. And, and it's also a name that shows we fear them. We want to call them artificial because we don't want to grant them agency. But at a certain point, uh, this kind of intelligence will have agency. I think that will happen. So what will happen what, to the Richards? Uh, to the Richards? To the rest of us? No, I don't know. No, to people like you. To people like you. Well, I mean, perhaps 
perhaps these machines will do a better job of running the world than people like me have. Right now- It better be women, uh, women, females. Women will, you know, uh, I'm not so convinced that women run the world any better. Angela Merkel and, uh, you know, uh, Indira Gandhi. I mean, we've had, we've had some examples of women Go leaders. Ahead. They're okay. I, I have nothing. I want women to be leaders. But I don't feel that I'm not an idea. I'm not a. We need I'm not a person leaders, who says whether it's when women run the world, the world will be better. Right. The, yeah. the world will be different. Hopefully, it'll be better. But the examples we've had so far, you know, uh, Golda Meir, the examples we've had so far have not shown us that yes. the women leaders are much different than the men. Right. Right. Tell me, Richard, you group. go all over the world. You what? write, I don't know, you wrote how many books? Whatever. 12, uh, I've, I've written about, uh, you know, it's hard to say. I mean, I could count them up. And but I will not tell you about, you know, how many articles minutes. and, yeah, yeah. So this is really a kind of chutzpah. I never asked this question. There is anything we don't know about you? There's not me or people who know you, people who read you and they know for all these they, years. They're, the people who read me get this much of me. I mean, there's a whole lot you don't know about me. And, and, and probably never will until a long time after I'm dead. And even then it'll take a lot of investigating. Oh. I mean, you'd have to sit down and read all of that, all of those notebooks to learn something about me. I can open, I can open a notebook at random. Look at this Let notebook. me just see. I'm and I'll, I'll, I'll read a, a, a something. Um, uh, you know, it's Look, like, oh. uh, All right, let, let me, this is like from 30 years ago, right? Where am I? I, I wanna get something. Uh, Anything you choose would be good, I'm sure. What? Just put your no, finger, it would be. Not a uh, all right, here's something. Earlier, sleeping, I wake suddenly with a total anxiety attack, panic. I feel often these days. And like a dream, I can't remember what it's about or even how it feels. It's an invasion from the unconscious, set off by being here instead of in my life. That is doing my work of being lost away from quote, everything, adrift, rootless, worthless. These feelings flow at a very deep level for uh, on the top, I don't feel this way. But underneath, clearly, I do. Uh, the driver returns. We're off. So this was uh, this was in the, my birthday on uh, August twenty third, nineteen seventy six, when I was turned forty two years. Well, wow. would you write this today? Would I write it today? You never write the same thing twice. Well, We're all well, I, I didn't mean today, but the feeling, the 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 inner world of what you just read us. That was the inner world of that Richard. Yeah, right. no, and, but, uh, but the inner world of this Richard also has his anxieties. Right. Different anxieties. That's what I meant. Mm -hmm. Well, Richard, uh, we could have listened forever. Silly, you didn't know him, but you know, I. Unbelievable. Well, Unbelievable. listen, thank you, you so much. You didn't touch on so many things like. We may have, or whatever. We and, may ask you to come back. <laughs> Will you come back if we ask you? I'll only come back if you get more than a thousand hits. Uh, okay, we, we will. I don't okay. want to, you know, just talk. I know. I love talking to you. We'll have coffee, but if you get a lot of hits, I'll come back. I'm okay. 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 okay, we'll check it out. Thank you. you. Thank you so thank much. Everybody. Thank Bye. you so much. Please. Yeah, and thank you, everybody. So you have to send me, send me the link so I know yeah. where to look at it. Yes. Yeah. Thank bye you bye. everybody. See you next week. Bye. Bye. Shalom. Shalom. Shalom.